and I see someone else joining. I think it's Min and Hello, Min. I remember seeing you in another webinar from this week, so it's good to see you again. Um, you can hear me. You just uh, want to note that in the chat room. It's helpful to make sure that's working. So though I think there's a few other folks that we're going to join, um, I want to respect everybody's time here, and so I think we'll we'll get started. I think then great body was working. So we'll we'll get started here. We'll kick things off some introductions, um, and then kind of dig into some of the uh, demonstration stuff that we're going to do here. Um, as I'm introducing myself and and my colleague here, Ross uh, Streeter. If uh, Elizabeth and Min, if you want to just introduce yourselves in the chat room briefly, that's just helpful for us to all get to know each other a little bit, and we can mention the institution you're from, and uh, you know, any specific questions you might be coming to this webinar uh, with, and uh, we'll, we'll interact as we go here a little bit. It's a small group, so it should be easy to do that. So let me uh, uh, kind of more formally not introduce myself. It's Josh Barron. I'm an executive director for the Northeast of the U.S. here for Women Learning. Uh, so I work with institutions to really uh, try to help make it as easy as possible to scale the adoption of educational, open educational resources as means to kind of impact on the largest number of students uh, possible. Uh, prior to coming to Lumen a few years ago, I was at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Maybe you're familiar with Marist. And, Left there after 13 years as an assistant vice president for digital education. So I've been in and around this work and this kind of environment. Um, and I'll, I'll just end here with my introduction to really uh, thank SUNY and CUNY uh, for helping organize and uh, get the word out about these webinars. Uh, Newman has had a close partnership with both systems for a while now through some grant work we've been doing. And as you may know, uh, there's been a bit of uh, an exciting kind of development with some state funding becoming available to support OER adoption, the scaling of that adoption, and we're very excited to be working with those systems. We're collaborating with each other as well to uh, to support that work. So let me uh, now turn it over to my colleague Ross uh, to introduce himself, and then I'll take it back over and give an overview of what we're going to cover here today. So Ross, you want to say hello? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Hi, everybody. I'm Ross Strader. Um, I'm the Director of Learning Engineering uh, at uh, Lumen. Excited to uh, show off some of the stuff that we've been working on uh, for you guys today. My background is uh, actually with the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University. I worked there for a number of years. We actually uh, collaborated with Lumen uh, on a few projects, and uh, so I got the chance to join the Lumen team about a year ago, and so I've, uh, I've been enjoying working with these guys for the past year. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll show you uh, some of the stats course that we've been working on, but I think Josh is going to talk a little bit uh, first about uh, what we do at Lumen. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ross. And Liz, I see you're from SUNY Orange, and although um, I haven't been interacted with folks directly there, I know that we've had uh, a number of interactions coming from the SUNY OER Services Group, and I think there's some work happening around the follow-up bookstore partnership we have. So if you have any questions about some of those things, you can certainly Oh, and on that note, I should say that please ask questions as we go through here. It's a small group, so we can easily field them as we go uh, or have a larger discussion at the end. If you want to put your questions in the chat room, that's often the best way of doing it, but feel free to pipe up here on the call as well and, and ask your questions uh, verbally also. Uh, okay, so let me, um, uh, well, actually, before I do this, let me just uh, briefly mention kind of what we're going to do here in the 45 minutes or so we have. So I will start off here with this first slide and a few others just to set a little bit of context for everybody. Uh, then I'll turn it off to Ross, who will spend most of the time demonstrating some of the OER content that we're supporting right now, particularly in the area of statistics. Um, and then I'll wrap it back up with talking about kind of some next steps in terms of what you might be uh, interested in doing in terms of either starting to pilot use of some of these materials in the fall. Uh, in many cases, you might have questions and want to see additional content or uh, dive deeper into materials, and we can make sure you have some ways of asking for some of uh, support in terms of doing those things as well. Uh, but ultimately, the goal here is to make you aware of some of the resources that are available in, in the statistics area, and then hopefully get some folks interested in starting to use that over the coming academic year. So let me just start with a little bit about kind of why I think we're gathered here today and why there's been, I think, now a very 
significant increase in attention around adoption of open educational resources. I'm sure you're kind of participating today, you're probably pretty aware of the significant increase in textbook costs that's occurred over the last few decades. And if you've looked at some of the research, you've probably seen numbers like 500, 600, 600 increases textbook costs over the last three or four decades. And I don't think it's really been seen now as a kind of crisis uh, in higher education. We have students, for example, who, who are going to food pantries at their institutions because they can't afford enough good, healthy food and, and charging them three, four hundred dollars or two hundred, three, three hundred dollars for textbook is really become quite a challenge and an issue. Um, so I think a lot of folks are starting to look at open educational resources given that I think there's now real consensus that they represent high quality materials that are obviously at a much lower or free uh, cost to students. Um, and I think that's really what brings folks to the table initially. I think what we're now also finding is that there's really compelling research that's happened over the last decade or so that's you know, showing that uh, things like first day access, um, meaning that students get access to the materials in the first day of class rather than the way that we can choose a financial aid to clear or whatever it might be, are really having a big impact on learning outcomes and student success metrics as well. So things like final uh, course grades and completion rates we're seeing are going up and improving based on the use and adoption of OER. And then the last point here, which I'm, I'm sure if you've used OER before, or working with faculty members or you've seen this yourself, uh, the ability to now have a lot more control and ownership over instructional content, I think, is, being, uh, is quite significant. And in fact, the content's openly licensed, and you can customize it uh, to meet your own specific local student needs, I think, is, is being seen as another huge uh, value add here. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Lehman's role here really is to try to reduce any barriers that might exist for uh, adopting OER and scaling that adoption. And so we support a number of technology platforms. You'll see some of those here in a few minutes in the demo to try to make it really easy uh, for folks to, to customize and use OER materials. And we also support some platforms that really try to bring up our equivalency to the OER table, meaning that uh, really making sure that instructors who are relying on certain technologies from commercial publishers have an equivalent set of materials when they move to OER. And then finally, we do a lot of support work, webinars like this, workshops, technical support, and so forth, uh, to be, again, try to make it as easy as possible for faculty members to, to make this transition. So before I turn it over to Ross, let me just briefly touch on these kind of three major uh, formats for uh, courses that we're currently supporting at Lehman, and I'll stress that as part of the partnership we have with SUNY and CUNY, you guys have access and your faculty members have access to all of these different courses, uh, all of which also integrate with your learning management system. So I think in most cases it's Blackboard, but I know in SUNY there's a few, few others that we do support that integration across all those systems. So in terms of our Candela courses, you can kind of think about these as kind of e-textbook replacements. And so this is very much the equivalent of what you might be expecting to get from a commercial publisher. Uh, so of course it has the text, videos, interactive, but also question banks, PowerPoint slides, but all the faculty resources that people have really come to count on and, and need when they're looking for this kind of uh, instruction materials. But then has that added advantage of being highly customizable. So you can easily go in because it's openly licensed and uh, customize it to meet all of your own needs. And at this point, there's more than three quarters of the kind of highest enrollment you know, general ed courses are covered by these uh, Candela course titles. So there's a good chance if you're teaching one of those types of courses that there's a Candela course already ready to go in a sense for, for you to use. The Lumen Own platform or online homework manager platform speaks to this point I mentioned a minute ago around kind of equivalency of resources and that there's a real need in certain types of courses, particularly ones that deal with quantitative topics like math courses, to provide students the ability to go through you know, numerous problem sets to, to kind of go through that problem solving process more than just, let's say, multiple choice questions, but really graphing things and doing that kind of analysis. And so we're supporting this, this homework uh, manager uh, as needs to provide that kind of resource. Again, it's mostly around math courses right now, but increasingly things like uh, econ and counseling courses and so forth are using this kind of platform as well. Uh, last, certainly not least, is one of the newest platforms that we're supporting called Waymaker. This is primarily what Ross will be demonstrating here in, in a few minutes. Uh, and the idea is to take the same open educational resources that are, let's say, used in our Candela courses, but now wrap a series of personalized learning tools for students and kind of uh, 
analytics-based uh, messaging uh, and, and uh, dashboard tools together for faculty members, so it becomes really easy for an instructor to identify which students are struggling in a course based on some analytics that runs behind the scenes and then intervene and help those students at the same time. Students are getting a much more kind of personalized set of recommendations of how to move through the materials and how to focus their study plan. The reason why uh, we're focusing on this in the demo, and I think the reason why this particular platform is getting a lot of attention right now, is really because it's starting to show this really major impact on students. I should mention this is coming out of the Bill and Melinda Gates Next Generation Course with Challenge Grant uh, that we're participating in. And what we're seeing is not just a reduced uh, cost of students, which comes from the OER that's used in these courses, but also this really big impact on student success metrics. So things like drop rates going from 14% you know, down to 5% of these courses. And I'll be happy to share if you have questions and want to see some of the studies and citations and so forth for some of these, these impact studies. I'm happy to share that here as we go forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ross, who will uh, demonstrate the uh, Waymaker Concepts and Statistics course. Again, just as one example, there's many other sets of materials that we can send to you and make provided to you if you're interested in other topics. Um, but this one seemed to be a good one to pick out the time we had. So Ross, let me end out the, um, or stop sharing my screen here. Uh, you can bring up the browser. Sounds good. While you're doing that, uh, Liz and Min, I'm, I'm curious to, uh, to, to ask you guys one question. Are you uh, statistics faculty or are you in math or a different department altogether? If you could uh, type your answer in the chat there, I'm always interested to know uh, where of expertise lies. And thanks for uh, giving me the sharing option, Josh. Let me go ahead and start this. It looks like you guys can see my screen now. Is that right? Yes, Russ, that looks cool. And it looks like Min is uh, information literacy um, work in the library, so it probably works a lot of factors. Okay, great. And what about Liz? I haven't seen a, a reply from Liz yet, but I will maybe okay. know, uh, let folks know that uh, we do have faculty members both in SUNY and CUNY already either planning on or already have used this concept in stats course. Um, there's a faculty member at uh, Erie Community College and um, <clears throat> several in the CUNY system using it as well, so we have it with people in touch there. It looks like there's a uh, math instructor at all levels, so. Okay, great, thank you guys. All right, well, let me uh, get that window to go away. So this is uh, a demo uh, course that we have set up in Blackboard here with our concepts and statistics course. and. And just a minute on the, the history of this course, uh, like I said, uh, I worked uh, at the Open Learning Initiative uh, at Carnegie Mellon for a number of years. We collaborated with Lumen, and, and that collaboration continues. Uh, this is a course that was developed uh, by the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, we have uh, translated it into the Waymaker platform to take advantage of some of the affordances that uh, Josh mentioned in terms of the personalized and adaptive uh, learning capabilities and the, and the faculty messaging tools. So it's uh, kind of considered to be the best of both worlds. It has the, the robust uh, pedagogical uh, background that we spent a long time on at, at LLI, and, and now we're taking advantage of the, uh, the really neat tools offered by Waymaker as well. So uh, this course actually uh, has a, a lineage back to the Statway project uh, that you might have uh, heard of uh, with the Carnegie Foundation. We worked with them at LLI a number of years ago uh, the idea there is to provide an alternative approach to the traditional developmental mathematics sequence uh, so that instead of kind of getting stuck in this developmental math sequence that kind of consumed uh, kids too often, uh, instead the idea is that students learn math that is meaningful to their lives rather than math for math's sake. Um, and, and apologies, Liz, I, I love math for math's sake as an engineer. <laughs> so, um, but I think the idea is to, uh, to give students uh, uh, the ability to learn math sort of in the context of, of some, uh, some practical applications. So that's kind of the history behind the course. You'll see in Blackboard here, we have a couple of uh, folders that are intended for faculty. And then uh, we dive right into the ones. That, there's one that uh, helps students kind of understand what Waymaker is and what the idea is behind it. And then we have the different modules in the course. So let me dive into the first one here, statistical studies. 
Uh, and then, so here we have a study plan. That's where all of the content uh, of Waymaker lives. It'll be one of these study plans for each module in the course. There's about uh, 14 or 15 modules in this course. And then there's the quiz in this folder as well, the summative quiz that students take after, uh, after uh, finishing learning the content in the study plan. So I'll click on study plan here. And this is where we get into some of the work that we did with the Gates Foundation uh, around competency-based uh, personalized learning. So this is split into three sections. There's a get started section here. There's a dive in section, which is where most of the content is, and then a finish strong section. Uh, so that format is the same uh, for all of the modules. The dive in section may have uh, more or, or, or less of these tiles. These are sort of sections of, of the module. Uh, but they all start with this getting started section and then this uh, finishing section down here. And I'll, I'll demo what's in each one of those. We tend to start each module with a Why It Matters page, uh, sort of a high level, you know, but before we dive into the concepts here, um, what are we actually doing here? How does it relate to my life kind of thing? Uh, and so this is talking about the idea behind statistics. Uh, we start with the population, uh, gather data about the population, and then uh, on down where we're using that data and, and our knowledge of probability to draw inferences back about the population. So again, we're just trying to center the student in, in sort of the big picture here with, with what we're doing. And each one of these, in this course, each one of these Why It Matters pages will refer back to this image and kind of point out where we are in this big picture of statistics. I go down here and click Next. Now I come to the show what you know, which is a pretest. Uh, this one has three questions. Again, uh, the idea is, is not that I've uh, mastered anything yet. I haven't even seen any content. It's really to, to get a baseline for, uh, for how I'm doing on these concepts. Uh, and again, this goes back to the idea of competency-based learning. You know, We may have students coming in that have had statistics before, but are, are taking this course again because it's been a number of years. Or maybe they haven't had a stats course, but they've learned some of these things uh, along the way through job experiences and so forth. Um, so the idea is to give the student a chance to evaluate their knowledge and, and where they need to focus their time uh, uh, in the study plan and in the module. So if I start this, I'm just going to click on the first answer for each one of these in the interest of time. And then I submit. And it says, OK, well, you know, no surprise, since I, I wasn't actually uh, trying to take the test, I didn't do very well. Uh, so I don't already know very much in this case. What I need to learn are all three of the concepts that we tested here. Uh, so having done that now, let me go back to the study plan. And we have, this is a, a demo course, and so we have a, a little hidden cheat button down here, which will let me show you what this looks like for a student who has actually done this in, in a real course. So again, there's a show what you know that I just did. After I take that, I come down here, and uh, each one of these tiles was updated. These were all gray before. So this, I should clarify, this doesn't correlate to the 0% that I just got uh, by showing you that, that pretest. These are some sample data for what a student might get. And in this case, the student had actually done well on one of the questions about sampling, uh, but had uh, not answered correctly the, the other two questions on, on either of these modules. So it just, it gives me a highlight. Again, there may be six or seven or 10 sections in this module. And it gives me a, an overview of where I, I should focus my time as I work through this module. Um, so I need work on these, but this one is, is on track. But we don't say that you've mastered this yet because we can't say that with uh, a lot of confidence based on one question. So it, it's just a general guideline. It's not any sort of you know, summative, yes, you, you mastered this, you placed out of it, you're, you're ready to move on. We, we don't give them that many questions to make that distinction. So we do want them working through all of these. Again, the idea is just to focus their time. Uh, let me go ahead and dig into this first section, and uh, I'm actually, actually I'm going to do this tile on sampling because I'm going to show you guys a neat interactive that we have here. One of the, the key things that we did at OLI was, um, this was early on back in 2002, uh, where there wasn't a lot of online learning, and we worked with some cognitive psychologists and learning scientists there at Carnegie Mellon to figure out, you know, what advantages do we have in this new environment as we, as we start to put classes on the web, uh, you know, what can we do differently that, that uh, would, would better take advantage of some of the things that we know about uh, human learning? And really what the learning scientist said was that students learn by teachers know this. You, know, you can lecture to a student, but until they actually start diving in and practicing and doing the homework and getting their hands dirty, uh, you know, that, that's where it really starts to, to sink in. 
And so we try and take advantage of that in a, in a number of ways. One of which is we have, uh, instead of just explaining concepts to them, we have these simulations wherever possible. So these are scattered throughout the course. Um, and, and this section is on sampling uh, and sampling variability. So uh, let's see, I think the idea here is that I go through, there's some instructions up here. I'm gonna go through and mark five circles just at random, okay? And my average diameter is 38. And I can reset it and, and do it again if I want to. Now I go down, and then there's some questions on, on my experience there. I recorded what I found. Now I go down here and I generate just a random sample. And my, uh, my uh, average diameter is 16. Let me reset and I'll do that again. 13, 22. So you'll see that those are lower than the one that I picked, which is 38, because there's some bias there. It turns out that we're naturally biased towards picking some of the bigger circles. Uh, so even, of course, I, I know the results of this, but, but even uh, when you have people picking at random, they generally don't pick the little tiny ones. And so that is a neat way to introduce the idea of, uh, of sampling bias. The other thing that we do is we don't just have the student reading content and watching videos. We have them answering questions wherever possible. Um, even just things like this where they, uh, they record their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, what they, the, the number that they got for that simulation up above on down to asking questions about what they think is going to happen, exploring uh, different options. Uh, and then, if I keep scrolling here, here's a question that puts us into practice. And I won't go into this in any great extent because of time, but the idea here is that there was a, uh, a poll in the 1970s. Uh, Ann Landers asked her readers if they had to do it again, would they have kids? 10,000 readers responded, 70% said no. Uh, which is, you know, surprising. And so then Good Housekeeping uh, did the same poll, and 95% said yes. So that's a huge difference. Why is that? Uh, well, so one common answer that students give in this case uh, is sampling variability due to chance. You know, no samples are the same, so they're, they're going to be different. And if I check my answer, it turns out that, you know, while samples do vary, from samples this big, they don't vary that much if they're representative. And so now, what we try and do with these wherever possible is the distractors to this question, the incorrect answer options, uh, aren't just chosen at random. They're chosen by looking at artifacts of student work and mistakes that students make and misconceptions that students have. Uh, so the answers represent those mistakes, and then we have this feedback that is targeted towards correcting those mistakes in real time, uh, which we found to be really powerful at OLI. And again, this comes from the the work that we did with the cognitive psychologists, if we can correct that misconception right when it's happening, as opposed to the students turning their homework and, you know, even if you guys as teachers take the time to write all kinds of good feedback, and even if the students read all that good feedback when they get the homework back, their mind's in a different place than it was when they made that mistake. And so this to me is one of the big benefits of online learning is the ability to do exactly this. As students are working through the uh, a course and making these mistakes, to be able to correct those in real time, I think is, is really nice. Um, let me go back now to the study plan. That was, uh, uh, that was just an example of one of the pages that we have here. But I wanted to take you on down to this finishing section. Um, let's see. Ah, and let me actually, I'm going to switch to a different module because there's a neat type of uh, synthesis activity that we have called Stat Tutor. I wanted to show you, and those aren't available in every module. So I believe that there's one in this next module here. And, and Ross, I'll just jump in. Yeah. There's a note in the chat, which, you know, which I know you can't see, Wayne, that they are, they are starting a Quantway class this semester. So I just thought I'd pass it. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's that way, and Quantway uh, came out of that same project. So, um, yeah, good to know. Uh, so in this module, you see there's this extra tile that we didn't see in the other one called Stat Tutor. Uh, let me go ahead and launch that. And this is a synthesis activity that has the students applying the concepts that they learn in these different modules. Um, the format of the activity is there's a problem statement, in this case an always popular uh, drinking habits of college students. We have uh, one or more questions that we're going to ask about that problem. So in this case, uh, it's asking about the drinking habits of students at that university and it has the different variables in the data set. Then we have the data set itself, um, which is available in several different statistics packages. That's one other thing I should point out about this course. We support all five of these, uh, Minitab, Excel, StatCrunch, R, and even the TI calculator uh, for students to uh, work through um, 
uh, exercises and, and homework sets, and then the stat tutor activity using, uh, using those statistics packages. So I'm running short on time, so I want to dig into this as much as I might otherwise, but I'm happy to, you know, to hook up with you guys uh, separately and, and show this off more if you're interested. The idea here is that they're going through and they're looking at the problem, uh, you know, being, becoming familiar with the data set, and then they actually dig down and uh, try and figure out what they're going to use to represent these data. And this also comes out of some, uh, some cognitive tutor work at, at Carnegie Mellon, where it turns out that students that were really good at you know, deciding what, uh, what display is appropriate for a given data set didn't really understand that for two quantitative variables, for example, you want to use scatter plot and, you know, and so on and so forth. They were just better at trying something and saying, oh, that doesn't look quite right, and you know, let me pick another one until they got it right. So that's, uh, that's actually why this, this tutor was created, to help students understand, again, you know, we're, we're choosing scatterplot because of the, well, not in this case, but we're choosing scatterplot when we have two quantitative variables, and, and that's the reason why. So again, this is a synthesis activity that we have, uh, I think there's seven of them throughout the course. The last thing that I'll show, and then I'll turn it back over to Josh, who will show some of the uh, faculty messaging tools that Waymaker has. Uh, but the last thing I wanted to point out here in that finish strong section is we have a putting it together page and that just sort of bookends that why it matters page to again step back up a level and say we were we were doing a deep dive into these different concepts here's why that's applicable to you uh, and then we have a summative quiz um, and I won't uh, I won't bother going through that now but uh, the, the quiz also, you saw that the pretest updated the students' uh, progress through these and, and kind of their status on these tiles. The quiz would feed into that as well. Uh, last thing, and I'm sorry, Josh, I keep saying that. I'm almost ready to kick it back to you, but uh, I won't dive into these. But again, just so you know that this is there. We have, uh, whoops. There are uh, assignments that come with the course. Uh, so I didn't show a lot of the statistics package uh, assignments, but the, those live here as well. And so uh, here's one on the histogram that asks a question. It gives you a data set about uh, Oscar winners and then gives you instructions for how to do that assignment in uh, each of those five statistics packages. And this is something that the students would do and then um, uh, turn into you guys as teachers to, to be graded. It's a hands-on uh, assignment. It's not automatically graded by the Waymaker system, but we provide that so that there are, are things that students do and, and can turn in in class as well. Uh, so Josh, I'll stop sharing and turn it back over to you to show some of the tools available to faculty. Great, Ross. Thanks a lot. Helpful demonstration there. Appreciate it. Okay, so let me just share my browser here again. Let me bring that up. Okay, so we're looking at uh, the same materials really that, that Ross was just showing. What I just want to start with is this kind of um, quiz that occurs at the end of each module. So a lot of what Ross was showing in terms of the stats tutor and some of the embedded self-check uh, kind of things is really just for students to kind of uh, understand where they are in the learning process, give them some feedback, encourage them to study in certain areas more if they need it. But then there is a graded assessment here at the end. Uh, you'll and see you can that. see that, that Josh is doing better than I was because he has well done on his first two tiles. So good job, Josh. Well, that's always the case, Ross, right? So. <laughs> I'm also an engineer, so I love math for math for uh, sake too, but, uh, but I, I get that's not, not for everybody. Um, so anyway, so in this case, I've kind of turned on some fake data so you can see what it would look like once a student had taken the first attempt of the two attempts of this quiz. And by default, the system gives students two attempts, and that's very intentional. It's part, again, of this mastery learning approach where the idea is to not have students go on, not have students go on to the next set of, of materials and module until they've demonstrated some level of mastery of the, the um, concepts. And so the idea is, in this case, they're going to take the quiz once. They'll get some feedback showing where, okay, in the conduct conducting experiments uh, section there, they might need to spend some more time studying. And then they'll uh, go back, hopefully do that, um, maybe get some feedback from you as the instructor as well, and then go on and take the second attempt of the quiz, which hopefully, obviously, they would be doing uh, better in. So let me now switch over to the faculty tools that um, 
Ross was just mentioning, so you can see this in the faculty dashboard of what it uh, looks like to start tracking students as they're going through these assessments and then also reaching out to them for these things that might need help if they're struggling. And so again, I'm going to kind of turn on some, some fake data here just so we can see what this would look like in a real course. And so you can see right now it's indicating that there are three students who are uh, struggling in this course right now. And again, that's something the system is determining through a lot of the underlying analytics in terms of the data it's tracking on what students are doing in the system, how well they're doing, uh, and so forth. So if you go in here and at a high level, see there's three, three students here. I can kind of expand out uh, to see kind of more specifically where they're struggling. And you'll see they all happen uh, to be uh, struggling the same learning objective. And that might be an indication to me as the instructor that I need to cover that more in class next time, and maybe some of the things I covered previously weren't so clear to folks. So I think just from an instructor perspective, seeing that kind of information is it's really useful. Uh, but then I can go and drill down into a specific student and get a little bit more information about what's going on with them. In this case, it's uh, Justin. You'll see that there's some uh, information at the top about Justin that uh, they fill out, the student fills out as a Free survey when the course starts, so you get a little bit of that information up front. And then you can kind of drill into some of the specific information coming from their quiz attempts and so forth. And so this, this one here is a, probably a good example uh, where uh, Justin has taken his first attempt on the quiz three days ago. Uh, he was pretty confident that uh, as the students go through and answer questions, they're also asked to provide this confidence level, as you may have seen, uh, as to you know, how confident they are in the questions. And so he's indicating he's confident, but didn't do terribly well on the quiz. And that might be an indication that it's going to be useful for me to reach out uh, to Justin and see if he needs some extra help or come into my office to do some office hours. And so I've gone back to the dashboard here. We can see there's a messaging tool. And this just provides a really easy, convenient way for you to reach out to the students who are struggling. Uh, we give you a template, basically, to save some time, although it's completely customizable. So if you wanted to remove what's there, and put in your own materials, you can do that. Um, you'll see that it automatically identifies the learning objective where Justin was struggling. Again, that's using the analytics. Each uh, individual uh, quiz and assessment question is uh, associated with a specific learning objective, so that's how we know kind of exactly where he's struggling in the course. Um, there's a second template here that you can use that's more about sending Justin some additional resources to look at. So uh, we try to give you a couple of different options, but again, you can kind of put your own message together there as well. I won't go through the whole setup process, but you can also set up some automated messages as well. Um, so I'll just show a few aspects of that here, maybe. Briefly. The idea here is, first of all, we, we, uh, we give you the option of a couple of different personalities. Uh, personas, we find that instructors tend to have different tones in their messaging, and so some tend to have a more formal tone, of an advisor tone, others are a more informal kind of coaching tone, so we give you some options there. Um, and then there's kind of two different, you know, there's two different uh, automated messages that can get sent out. One are study tips, and what's, uh, this is useful for is that the students are not taking a lot of those self-checks and the, the assessments as they go through the materials, which as the research has shown doing those really does correlate to uh, doing better in the course, then some automated messages can go out to the student kind of encouraging them, hey, did you know that taking these, uh, these assessments uh, really is helpful in doing better in the course and try to get them to do more of those? And then you can also um, have these kind of uh, reward messages or positive reinforcement messages go out when a student does really well on a quiz, exceeds or reaches that threshold that you can determine, they can get a nice message from you congratulating them. And what we hear a lot from faculty members is that obviously you're busy, lots of students that you're working with, and often the limited time you have is focused on the students who need uh, the most help. Uh, and often you don't have time to necessarily send a student out a nice message saying, hey, great job. Uh, but students really appreciate that. We get a lot of positive feedback from students by having these kind of automated messages uh, going out um, or allow you to do that without having to spend a lot of time. There's a number of other district capabilities I won't have time to show here, but hopefully gets you a, a, a feel here for what it's like to, uh, or, or the, the additional tools that you get as an instructor in terms of the Waymaker courses. 
uh, and how they can be used to really both easily identify the students that are struggling and then reach out to those students to intervene and help things uh, turn around. And again, there's a lot of evidence that we're being uh, able to collect at this point from the Gates Project showing there's a real impact on student success uh, from using this kind of